Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Uh, today I wanted to go through the books that I've been reading this week and uh, it's, I mean, spoiler alert, it's very much dominated by book prizes, but then when is it not? Um, but yeah, with the Women's Prize, the International Booker, the Republic of Consciousness Prize, there are books floating around that I've been that I've basically been wanting to read anyway, um, in a lot of cases that I've now sped up and, and started reading sooner, I guess, or others that have just, because of various prizes, have now entered my my sort of awareness. Um, so that's largely what I've been reading. Um, but yeah, let's go through and talk a little bit about them. I should note at the beginning, for the International Booker, I am hoping to do videos for most, if not all, of the long lists sort of individual review videos. So we'll go into more detail on some of those here. And these will be a relatively spoiler-free thing within this video as well. Um, for the Women's Prize, I might only do that for the short list, just because I think there are like 16 on the long list, and I don't know when I'll actually end up reading them all, <laughs> um, if, if I'll read the whole long list, but there we go. Um, but to start us off, a couple from the Women's Prize uh, long list. And um, I was already reading this when the announcement came out, so in many ways, nice timing. Um, and that is Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. And uh, this book, I think, I, I just really enjoyed in so, so many ways. So it sort of riffs on uh, David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. And actually, there's a nice little nod to it um, at one point in the book where a character is reading Charles Dickens and somebody else says something about like, oh, you know, reading those like, you know, Charles Dickens books or whatever. Um, and I think Demon Copperhead is a book that I I found really quite interesting and quite surprising in many, many ways. It, um, I, so I read David Copperfield just before it to kind of get into the, the frame of mind and to see what the references might be. And um, it, it does kind of that really fun thing that I think a lot of uh, literary adaptation sort of style books do um, in being not just sort of a, a direct one for one uh, sort of copy or whatever of the, the original book, but really taking it to new places, really developing some of the key ideas, but also just sort of focusing on new other bits that, that maybe wouldn't have been in it. So in David Copperfield, we have a lot of the story around a young man who um, is sort of a bit of an outcast from birth. He sort of is this sort of orphan style kind of child. I mean, he kind of floats through being owned almost by different families. His name seems to to vary quite a lot. He's kind of, you know, he, he manages to, he sort of is the underdog tale of somebody who who takes a bad situation and, and is able to, to grow into this new man. And uh, Demon Copperhead takes some of those ideas and really modernizes um, the challenges that maybe face this young person. So uh, Demon in the book is a young man who is in a family where there is a pattern of addiction and um, where, you know, Oxycontin and various other drugs are around him and a part of his life. And as a result, I think that's a really interesting modern take on it. It would have been quite easy to just situate this book in a sort of standard, uh, you know, in a sort of standard more like working class narrative um, but I think to add the kind of the complexity of layers of things like the oxy problem in the US um, and elsewhere, but in, in parts of the US, it's, uh, you know, really, really run rampant. Um, and to take that and to develop a narrative out of parts of that, I thought was really clever. I think it does some really exciting and interesting things in developing this character of Demon um, and looking at how he would adapt to the world. Um, I, I listened to it as an audiobook, and I think the thing I found quite interesting was because of the accent, for some reason, my mind kept on wanting to put it, because it because it's based on Dickens, and because of, it was sort of like a southern US accent, for some reason, my brain defaulted to it being historical fiction. And so I, it, my brain kept on imagining this young demon in the 60s or, or earlier. And... Um, then he mentioned the Spice Girls and it was a real, <laughs> a real sort of and Tamagotchis and other things. And it was a real sort of wake up that Demon in this book is basically my age <laughs> or thereabouts, you know, sort of a child of the 90s. Or I mean, I was born in the 80s technically, but grew up a lot in the 90s. And so, um, yeah, it was just this sort of surreal um, experience with parts of that, but I thought worked really well. Um, and I think overall as a book, I, I just found it really engaging, really entertaining. And I loved what Barbara Kingsolver did. It's my first book of hers. Um, 
did with the narrative around that in terms of really expanding this this initial story with you know lots of nods and references throughout the book but but doing some other really cool things in the meantime also from the women's long list i read homesick by jennifer croft and i was already quite excited to check this out anyway um and the nod from the women's prize was sort of enough to be like right i'm gonna actually check this out now um, and i listened to the audiobook of this and the the key premise essentially i mean it's in many ways also fiction there's a lot that mirrors jennifer croft's own life um, but it's the tale of these two sisters, Amy and Zoe, and they are, uh, you know, very close in age, only a few years between them. Um, Amy is this sort of uh, wunderkind kind of child, you know, she's very, very bright. She goes to uni at 15. Um, you know, she's a bit of a, a prodigy in many ways. And her sister Zoe um, has a series of health problems. And that often means that these two very, very close sisters end up really experiencing the world in so, so many different ways. Um, and it's interspersed, this book, with with comments on the notion of translation. And so Jennifer Croft herself is a translator. Um, primarily, this is her first book sort of in her own name, instead of it, I suppose, instead of it being translating somebody else's work. And um, she has these little bits in between where there are photos that she talks about or she comments on something about the 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 world of translation so for example you know um untranslatable words or um about the process of moving something from one language to another and how it doesn't always come across and at first i was like okay that's a nice little kind of quirk you know it's sort of an interesting thing um and the the initial part of this, the book didn't necessarily grip me. I mean, I, I was engaged by it. I thought it was really interesting, but I, I wasn't fully on board with it. And then somewhere around the midpoint of this book, it, for me, just took off in the most glorious, glorious way. Um, and I, I got really quite emotional at parts of this book. Um, slow, the slow build of these untranslatable terms, which are almost all about home or longing or belonging, um, and place and all these other things. So like Hireth in from Welsh, and I'm mispronouncing that terribly, but this idea of, you know, longing for a place that's no longer there. Um, these untranslatable words in terms of things like saudade from Portuguese and the sort of sadness, uh, the sort of sadness and, and almost like bittersweet kind of feeling. Um, all of these come into eventually build into this really beautiful picture i think um and there are without spoiling anything there are some scenes about midway through the book where the character starts really reflecting on homesickness in very very many ways so whether her own homesickness and longing for, for home this her own sense of what is nostalgia and homesickness what does that even mean because those things have changed forever and they're no longer there um and all of these really deep, beautiful conversations and really rich conversations happening. And it just stopped me in my tracks. I mean, I was still walking. I didn't actually stop. But I I just was completely blown away by what this book did. And I, I thought it was so poignant in so few pages about what it feels like to, to move and to leave. And there's a passage where um, she talks about living abroad and how, for her, the process of being abroad and um, adapting to a new culture and occasionally having moments of either thinking about home or realising that you've made a home in that place um, can be really poignant. And that really hit me hard as somebody who, for a while, lived abroad. And actually, I'd never seen it captured in quite that way. Of There's, a, there's something so... Uh, mundane about the homesickness of that of you know you miss some, sometimes the most basic things and you're also sometimes the most excited about having successfully ordered a coffee you know? <laughs> or like something you know um I, I just I just think this book is is a gem and I was just really blown away by what it achieved um so I think if you are struggling a little bit with the early part of this book I'd say to stick with it because I think it does get there um and for me just it was well worth that payoff of, of what it eventually built into. Next up, I read Children of Paradise um, by Camilla Grudova, um, also on the Women's Prize long list. And uh, this was just sort of a, a nice, easy happenstance because I was walking around a lot and um, I just found the audiobook for this and just thought, yeah, why not? And um, so this is uh, a book where our main character, Holly, goes and starts working at this cinema called Paradise, hence, you know, the the name of this book um and she joins this very weird ragtag bunch of people who are mostly roughly around her age you know sort of 
young adults, basically, and she is kind of part of this very weird world where nothing really makes much sense, where um, there are these sort of social rules of things around her that don't always seem to come together very well. So, you know, she is this sort of excluded person. She's sort of a bit of an outcast, but slowly comes to be part of the gang, as it were. But in the meantime, so many weird things happen. It's full of these sort of quite gruesome descriptions at times. There are quite a lot of, um, yeah, like, don't, don't, like, have dinner or food of any kind, really, while listening to this book, because it's quite visceral about some quite grim things. Um, to give you a flavour of what that is, you know, things she finds while she's cleaning up in a cinema um, would be one of it. Um, lots of bodily fluids, <laughs> so many other things uh, in this book. So, um, yeah, not always the, the most pleasant in that sense, but I, I really like what it did with, the con with sort of constructing this narrative of... Um, this young girl kind of working out who she is, but also these sort of madcap adventures happening in this cinema. Um, there are sort of sections of this book that are themed and named after films. Um, and I'm told that there are more references in there than I actually picked up on, because I, I'm, I, I'm not a major film buff. There's a lot that I probably went over my head, but it does sort of take as inspiration various films and some of those actions take place within the book as well um so a really interesting book and not really like anything i've read before a very short um, and interesting read i thought as well i also read a couple of books on the republic of consciousness book prize um and uh, those were also really interesting so that's a, an indie press prize a, a prize for indie presses um and what i think is always really interesting about that is those books are wild a lot of the time or they can be a little bit more experimental and really push the button a little bit push the envelope a bit more um so the first of those that i read was the deloriad by missouri williams and <laughs> i in some ways i'm like i don't really know what happened in this um it was a bit of a wild ride essentially <laughs> Essentially, there's sort of this uh, cult slash sort of movement um, and the, the, our sort of central character is outcast from that from the beginning um, and is sort of slowly trying to make her way back in. Another book, really, that is full of like very visceral things. There's lots of, of sort of mud and grime and blood and, and everything that goes on in this. And we basically watch as the character slowly tries to take back power but in the meantime it's this very weird world that at times feels very medieval at times feels very modern day it's a really w weird one to pin down um i know a lot of people have also pointed out that there are sort of it's a bit weird in terms of how this body talks about weight and particularly about sort of fat characters i mean it starts with a really lengthy description of a character's roles and flesh and, and what have you and this book seems quite preoccupied with that um sometimes in a way that i think adds to the narrative and sometimes in a way that i found a bit tricky because it just feels like it's there is sort of like oh isn't this gross um which i don't think is a particularly i don't know didn't didn't always feel like it helped much <laughs> in the narrative but still a really interesting book just wild it's a bit like what the hell is going on for most of this book um, and i kind of liked that aspect of it i have to say Next up, I read Chinatown by Tuan, um, translated by Nu uh, Win and Li. Um, and this book um is again a, a really fascinating one in terms of what it does. Um its narrative structure is is a challenge in the sense that although this book is only about 170, 180 pages, uh, there are no page breaks or like proper sort of um you know, chapter breaks or anything like that, because the idea is that this sort of character who is a um, a Vietnamese a Vietnamese woman is basically having these sort of stream of consciousness thoughts of her life and her experiences, both in Vietnam but also in France, where she now lives, um, and it's just this broad thing of all of these things that go on. So her dealing with the the racism um, in um, in France towards her, her dealing with structures um, that make things difficult for her, so things like permits and visas and, and all that kind of stuff. This life in Vietnam, this sort of love life, this sort of family drama, all of these things going on. So it's a kind of, I think this has been a really divisive one for a lot of people who've read it, where I think some people have gotten completely lost in the rhythm and have really absolutely loved it. 
because it sort of it it bring it, it really brings you in it draws you into kind of this rhythm and for some people where they're like this is impenetrable and i cannot get into the rhythm and, and sort of hear it um i quite luckily had a few long journeys where i got really into this um and i i think it's pretty brilliant actually um but it is a challenge and i think there were times where I was like i'm not entirely sure what's going on but i'm just gonna you know give in to the rhythm of this book and i think that feels like the right way to do it at least for me but it is it is a challenging one and um at times you're not really sure what's happening um but for me i think it, it really built into something quite profound before i go into international booker um books um i also read catherine may's enchantment uh, which i just thought was this really gorgeous book um so catherine may wrote wintering um and also has a podcast of the same name both of which i love um wintering was a book all about uh the you know seasons go by you know nature works in seasons where you have the winter period where you slow down you down tools you take a rest ready for spring where you you know erupt back into life and animals hibernate and all those other things and she makes a, a sort of comparison in that book from uh from from how we operate to kind of that we need winter periods even if that's just the weekend or if that's having a week off or whatever that we kind of need these these periods where we really stop and, and pause and reflect and enchantment builds on that idea um she talks a lot in this book about masking um and essentially how she um being neurodiverse uh ne neurodivergent she often struggles with masking with sort of having to adapt to the way that um, neurotypical people move through the world and so as a result that's an incredibly exhausting thing for her and so she needs even more time to stop and rest and avoid burnout and enchantment in many ways is about burnout um, she talks a lot in this book about having been completely burned out about trying to pick up the pieces again and find a way to enjoy life and so this book reads as this sort of very gentle meditation in some ways on how to look after ourselves how to be kinder to ourselves um, but also how to find some of this beauty um, in things around us. And it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous little book. So now because I've I mentioned I was going to be talking about the International Booker long list books, um, I'm going to be doing separate reviews on these. So I'll try and keep these brief because also I know that I've spoken loads about many of these books, uh, the, the other books on that I've, I've read this week. So I'll try and keep this relatively brief and a bit of a whistle stop tour through them. First up, Stillborn by Guadalupe Natal, um, translated by Rosalind Harvey, which I think is incredible. And I am pegging early on as my winner for International Booker. I'm sure there'll be other books that I'll also really love and really enjoy. For me, Stillborn is a masterpiece. It's a really quiet gem. It's um, It does so much in so few pages, I think. Um, the core idea is that um, there are two women who are good friends. Um, one of them... Uh, becomes pregnant and she finds out that her birth, her child is is due to have several birth defects that will mean that the child essentially either dies very soon after being born or will um will have a a very difficult life and so it's the com a lot of this book is sort of conversations or thoughts between these two women about what to do um about whether they take the steps to um to sort of end the pregnancy whether they um you know what the sort of drive is around humans and community in the meantime the 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 woman who is not pregnant um has all these meditations in her head about what it means to have a community to raise to raise children or to raise life um there's a pigeon on her um balcony and she watches as that builds a nest and looks after its little its young and so she has all these thoughts about it and i just think this book is exceptional it like the writing style captured me from right at the beginning i thought this was just a really stunning piece of writing it, even regardless of what the plot was I, I thought the writing was stunning um and i think it deals with a really difficult conversation um incredibly sensitively but also while sharing some real experiences that you know it is it is complicated there are there will be people who give birth and potentially regret it or there'll be people who have you know basically change their their minds every couple of minutes really or every couple of days during the whole process um and it's such a complicated and huge thing that um i think this book 
really gives it some space to breathe. And again, in only about 200 pages, we're not talking a very long book here at all. Um, but I just, I was really blown away by this. And I know I said I'd keep this really brief, but I, I love Stillborn so much that I, I, I want to just talk about it forever. But I, I just think this is an incredible book. I worry as well that I started maybe a bit strong with my booker, my international booker long list, because I really loved the first few I read. I mean, it's been a little bit tricky with some of the ones since. Um, I don't know. I mean, I say, say tricky. I still enjoyed these books, but... Um, I think I went from Stillborn, which I loved so, so much, and Time Shelter, which I also really loved, to being like, oh, okay, these other books are good. Um, but, like, I haven't necessarily been dazzled in quite the same way. Anyway, um, but this next book I did actually think was really strong in many, many ways, and that is Paya um, by uh, Peruval uh, Murugan, um, translated from the Tamil um, by Anirudan Vasuvadan. Um, and this book um, I thought was really interesting in so, so many ways. It is um, it starts off in an almost plain kind of language thing and slowly builds, I think. There's a real slow, slow kind of burn of violence, I think, in this book, actually, that I think is really clever and really interesting. So essentially, the core idea is that there are these two... Um, the, the book starts with these two characters arriving back in um, a village. So we have Saroja and uh, Kumarasan, and Kumarasan takes Saroja back to his village. And all the way through the book, uh, characters in this village start saying, well, you know, she's from a different caste and, you know, um, who is she? What, where have you, you know, where did you find this woman? Where did you meet her? How did this all happen? How could you get married without letting us know? And it's this sort of slow build of everybody in the village kind of being like, well, we're not going to accept her. And actually what starts to happen increasingly is that the village turns on this woman um, and it starts saying things like, well, you know, even if she is from the same cast, how do we know we can trust her? Um, and it starts becoming increasingly violent or oppressive. So people start shunning the woman, Saroja, at first. Then they start shunning the whole family and they say, well, we're not going to to be part of any conversations, you know, cease all trade, cease all communications um, with the family, with everybody involved, do not talk to this person um, until we've resolved something. Obviously that can't be resolved either if they're not able to speak to each other. So I think this book really slowly, it sort of just turns up the, the, the volume almost until at the end of the book, it's this really elaborate, um, complicated, sort of interpersonal drama, basically. And so I think this is really clever. So I actually almost take back what I was saying about reading them in the wrong order. I think Pyre was great. Um, uh, it, um, but I think, yeah, it's just, it's really clever, I think, for me, just how it's slow, there's this real slow burn. And by the end of this book, this book is is just, it's, almost, it's so oppressive almost to read. You're sort of trapped in this very difficult world um, between these characters. Um, yeah, so I thought it it did a really great job of, of doing that. And last but not least, I read Ninth Building by Zhao Jingzi, uh, translated by Jeremy Tiang. Um, and I um, I had sort of, in some ways, some mixed feelings about this. Overall enjoyed it. Um, I think, so essentially the book is, is a lot about this main character who's sort of in some ways the author, but, you know, there's, a, there's an autofiction element. Um, we're at least led to believe. Um, and this is all happening during the Cultural Revolution in China. And so we get a lot of these sort of little vignettes and stories um, about things that were happening at the time. So sometimes that's things like, um, you know, acts of violence happening around them. Sometimes that's just the the sheer boredom and, you know, the, the, the real averageness of life going on around them. Um, the kind of unexceptional nature of, of things. And that in some ways is borne out in some of the writing, which is a, in some ways a very plain style. And I think that sometimes really works for this book and sometimes I think I struggled with, is it's very, very... It, it reads almost at times like a, a non-fiction book um, or more like a memoir, for example, where we're kind of stating a bit of some of the facts that are happening and some of the impacts on people around them, um, but not necessarily this sort of big literary thing doing kind of, you know, aiming for these other things. So sometimes that plainness of language really works for the content, I think, and the sort of form and function sort of sit together quite comfortably, where we're talking about the averageness of day-to-day -day life and it's told in this very plain, spare language. 
at times, this book, I think, then is unfortunately for me a little too plain, where I think um, sometimes I kind of almost needed this book to kind of try and then take some of these ideas and play with them and find new ways of expressing things. Um, whereas, you know, it's um, it's almost a bit sometimes like a, a, a general history of what is going on. Um, and I kind of think I wanted this sort of pizzazz, um, which is maybe a lot to ask for a book that's talking about some really dark topics. Um, but yeah, it's it's sort of... I mean, I, I wonder if that's partly intentional, right? If you look at the cover of the book, at least in the UK, it's very grey, it's very sort of, you know, I, I think that's the point, right? That we're not kind of going for like big song and dance, like, woo, look at look at what happened. I think as a result, as a reading experience, it was just quite a weird one for me because there were these moments of of humour and, and what have you, and then at times just this sort of slightly flat expression. And I get that that's partly the point, but that doesn't always necessarily translate into the most exciting reading experience. Anyway, I shall stop there. Um, those are the books that I've been reading this week. And it's been a really fun set of books. There are a few others that um, I've sort of, I'm most of the way through that I'll talk about probably next week instead. Um, and in some ways, this this week of reading was slightly more than a week uh, because I filmed the last one early because I was away over the weekend, blah, blah, blah. But um, really excited to to read more of the International Book Along list. I've got a fair few more to go. Um, and uh, yeah, to also read a lot of the other incredible other work that's going on outside of prizes at the moment. Um, so we shall see. Uh, but speak to you all soon. Thank you so, so much. And take care. Bye bye. Have a good week.